Hello and welcome to the latest event in the Royal Television Society's Digital Convention. I'm Charlene White and I'm joined by CEO of ICV, Carolyn McCall, for about 30, 35 minutes of chat about the, her vision for ICV and also how she's managed to navigate what has been an extraordinary 2020. Now, as many of you will already know, Carolyn joined back in 2018 after eight years as CEO at EasyJet. And before that, she had management roles at Guardian News and Media. So it should make for a really interesting chat today. Carolyn, thank you so much for talking to us today. Pleasure. Now, none of us saw this pandemic coming. No. At all. No. I mean, at what point was it that you realised this is really going to impact what we do as broadcasters? Actually, quite early. Um, I th I, we were talking about the impact because lockdown had been talked about for quite a long time and it was happening in other countries. And so... At ITV, the management board just decided that we would test working from home before it actually became a necessity. And so we actually locked down five days earlier and just, and actually our IT systems worked seamlessly, but it allowed us to have a bit of breathing space to get used to working from home in terms of if people needed equipment or things to be moved around, we could do all of that. So we, did, we didn't see it coming in terms of what the impact was actually going to be, because I think most of us thought, It'll be four to five weeks. We'll all be back in. Most people left their stuff at work, you know. So um, when I realised it was really, really serious was when all our productions stopped. So we just went from about 280 productions worldwide to zero virtually. And when you're, the, when you're the big boss and that happens, what's the strategy? What, what do you do? We started thinking about how we get production back almost immediately. So we had a crisis group and we had a back to production group and they kind of worked in parallel. So we were managing the crisis and it really was a full blown crisis. And ITV, because we're a publicly listed company, unlike any of the other broadcasters, we had to conserve our cash and we had to look after our people. Um, but we had to do both of those things. Yeah. And, and we had to take them both very seriously. So it, cash was absolutely front of mind um, because it was going to be about surviving and we didn't know how long it was going to last. So, um, it, but but our, our focus on getting production back was absolute. And we were working with government, with DCMS and with other people in government to think about how we could do that on a production basis, what exemptions we could get, how we could do it safely, obviously, and kind of manage risk. Um, and that was important. Now, we were still producing 10 hours of live programming, which was a lifeline, really, for people in Britain. It was amazing. Um, and... I think the value of public service broadcasting, if, if, if it was not known by the public, became extremely well known over that period of time. Well, I was on maternity leave when, when lockdown first happened. And I have to say, seeing those daytime shows stay on air made me feel as though, OK, I think we're going to be all right. Every time I turn over and see Phil and Holly doing this morning, it's like, despite everything else that's happening, if they're on TV, yeah. then we're going to be all right. So we couldn't keep them away. So we had people lining up to work on daytime as well as in news. And in, news were incredibly inventive and innovative about how they broadcast from homes, from warehouses, from garages, from, you know, it was unbelievably inventive. And, and people make allowances for that, you know what I mean? But daytime was in studio. And so actually what was brilliant for everybody was to see that they could do it and do it safely and so we learned a lot of what we would f implement in the future in terms of, terms of our safety protocols from how we were doing it live um, and you know this lifeline thing I and mean, we got so so many emails and and texts saying thank you thank you thank you this is so reassuring and because we are a trusted medium so the fact that you know what we say is factually accurate it's impartial it's you know, all of those things. But then on daytime, you also have opinion. You have opinion, you have comment, you have people saying what they really think. It was it, all of that. It was entertaining, informative and reassuring. And I think, you know, you can't get a better description of what PSB should be about. Oh, really. absolutely. And of course, you had to have staff in studios to be able to produce those yes. programmes. So how were you able to ensure that people were safe of course, you want to be able to broadcast the nation, but you also have to make sure that your staff are OK as well. It was that, I mean, genuinely, I'm sure everyone is going to say this because it has to be true, which is our staff were our number one priority. So as I said, it was our staff and then cash. But 
if you are going to get people to work, you have to take the utmost care. And that's what we did. So we took a lot of advice. We've got um, a former um, chief medical officer who works for us, uh, Dr. Paul Litchfield. He's absolutely amazing. And he helped us put in place a whole load of protocols um, from temperature checks and should we do them on all shows or not uh, to, you know, all, all of the things, distancing, how we film, what do we, you know, for instance, well, you know this better than most yeah. people, but I mean, we didn't have multi, m multiple people, uh, you know, behind the screen. So we would take each function would kind of do their bit. And that takes a lot longer to film. But actually, it was the safest way to film. So, it, you know, it changed a lot of how we do things, but it was it was it, it was done. Is there anything that you would change about those initial decisions that you made? Um, I don't think actually it's not so much changing the initial decisions. It's what we've learnt from those initial decisions. So actually things like um, remote editing, you know, more than possible. And uh, in the past, people would say, well, we're not, we can't do that. We can't finish. We can't do this. We can't do that. Actually, so much was possible. So I think instead of actually changing things, the fact we had to adapt so quickly and we had to be innovative about how we adapted means actually I think what will happen is we will change how we do things mm -hmm. going forward. And money will impact that, of course, because advertising has changed, the way you make programmes has changed. So has the commissioning process slowed? Are you looking at, at, at less of a budget for programmes now? Not really, no, I don't okay. think so. I mean, I think our, our MPB will be up next year because we've got the Euros and we've got things that didn't run this year. So our, our, our programme budget went down this year because we weren't putting things on air because we couldn't or we couldn't produce certain shows that we had intended to produce. That's the reason the budget went down. But actually, a lot of that is going to go back in next year. And so actually, it's not about budgets being cut. I think actually, if you are a, you know, you're putting content on air, whatever you call yourself, um, you have to compete. And the only way you can compete is through your content. And so you have to have the best content you can find to put on screen. And the only way to do that is to invest in content. Now, does the type of content change just because as a result of, of lockdown and the pandemic, so many families are spending so much time together at home mm. in a way that we just haven't really in recent years. Does that mean the types of things that you put on TV changes because it's, it's not just individuals anymore, it's families probably almost seven days a week? Well, I don't actually think for ITV it changes that much. I mean, I think one of the things we have to do is engage 16 to 24s and 16 to 34s for that matter in a different way. And that is about, you know, being very agnostic about where you put your content and how you market it and how you communicate to them. And actually maybe doing some different kinds of short form content for them. Okay. That's a different thing. I don't think ITV has to change what it's doing on its mass simultaneous reach platform, which is ITV1. I mean, we reach millions and millions of people, as you know. We're the only place you can get those really, really big audiences. And actually that's partly because we do so many family entertainment shows and we do them so well. And so actually it played to our strengths and more people discovered um, the joys of Saturday Night Takeaway and Anton Deck doing them from their homes and being very open about how they, how they were doing it. Um, it play, I think it really played to the strengths of ITV in that way. And the ITV Hub comes into that as well because yeah. so many people are now engaging online perhaps mm. than ever before when it comes to accessing our content. Definitely, definitely. I'll give an example of that, how Hub has changed dramatically. So we've invested a lot in Hub. It's one of our key priorities. It is the digital ITV. Um, but Des, which has been this amazing drama, um, has consolidated around 12 million, which as a series average, which is unbelievable. Yeah. It's brilliant. I mean, we've done it. It's been done before. White House Farm was very strong and, and, and Line of Duty has been very strong and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. However, 2 million of that 12 million was on Hub, was on ITV Hub. Incredible. That's big, big numbers. Yeah. And now, you know, 80% of 16 to 34s are registered on Hub and 30 million people are registered on Hub. So it's about making sure you continue to give them stuff on Hub mm. that draws them back in, not just catch up. So does that mean you perhaps start commissioning things to go on the Hub as opposed to going on any of the linear channels? So I think one of the things about our strategy is it, it has to continue to evolve because everything is changing all the time. And I think definitely you will see that in the future. You will see commissions that are geared to that kind of audience, yeah. the hub audience. 
eventually a lot more people will be watching on hub but that's not still the case a lot of people still watch a big screen tv and might continue to prefer to do that whatever they're watching on it they're still watching on big screen TVs. Well, let's talk about another big event of this year. That, of course, was the Black Lives Matter movement, yes. which saw so many people up and down the country um, take the streets to protest, but also have conversations within their own workspaces, for example, um, about prejudice and racism, for example. And, and one thing that has been huge as a result of those Ofcom complaints regarding diversity in Britain's Got Talent. Yeah. And you, as a company, immediately back to them with those big um, adverts in the newspaper. Mm. Was that very much a, a conscious decision or did it feel as though we have to do the right thing or do you know what, we're backing, we're backing the people that work for us, we're backing our talent and it's the right thing to do? Well, look, I think BGT has always been a really diverse show, always. It's, it's embraced you know, diversity of all sorts. Uh, you know, it, not, it is about, you know, disability as well as uh, gender, as well as... Uh, black and Asian minority ethnic, you know, groups. It, it's always been very diverse. And so, um, you know, we're always shocked. I mean, we did something called Black Voices, you know, on ITV where people actually talked about everyday racism in their lives. And we got really, really severely negative comments about that. And our viewer service centre could hardly, you know, I mean, they really found struggled. But then, you know, when you took it in the round, there were also loads and loads of positive comments. And I think if you only listen to social media, then you only get one side of the story because yeah. they're the most, it is the most punchy and the most kind of vicious in a way reaction that you get. So if you only take that, you don't get the whole story actually. And so when that happened and when we realized that uh, actually, it was really affecting some people uh, and that it was very, very difficult for some of the individuals involved in that. Um, our creative director and our agency uh, kind of just talked about it and said, what if? Uh, Ashley liked it. Uh, Kevin liked it. I, I, I felt it was important to run it. And that's how it got on. Um, and it's, it was really powerful and, and actually most powerful internally. In what way? I mean, from a personal oh, perspective, within, seeing that seeing that advert, I was like, "Wow!" I work for a company that does that. That's incredible. within seconds. Within seconds of people seeing the ad, I had so many emails, text messages from people internally, from every part of the company, yeah. um, and 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 that's actually more powerful in some ways than what anyone else thinks about you. Yeah, it's true. It's true, but it's not an easy decision to make because. No. I guess prejudice and racism and Black Lives Matter isn't something that's suddenly arrived in the UK. No. It's a conversation that's been had for, for years and years. So what made you decide to actually, do you know what, we are going to make a stand? Well, I think it's because it was affecting our people, people who are both talent that works with ITV, but also people who work on those shows that are part of ITV. So I think that was really uh, the motivator. The other thing I think is, is that although the conversations have been happening, um, I know that they haven't probably been happening loud enough. Okay. And I think that's why there was such a big reaction to BLM. Yeah. Because everyone was going, well, why hasn't it changed? We've been talking about this for years. Why isn't it changing? And I think that's because it's a bit like a steamship. So unless you take very proactive action and it comes from everywhere, um, it's not going to change. And internally, you've seen changes too, haven't you? I yeah. mean, you've come up with this plan mm -hmm. for the next couple of years mm -hmm. and it, it feels as though you do feel passionate about changing things internally. Yes, but I've always felt that. Okay. And the reason that, so we had a diversity mm. plan, but the reason we called it an action plan is that we realised that all the actions we'd taken, and we'd done some really good stuff, but all of the actions we'd taken had not really gone into something substantive. It wasn't substantive enough. So we asked ourselves, why not? And I think it was partly because we were doing it incrementally. We were looking at the stats. We were going, well, if we just do this and we just do that, we'll get... And that's not what it's about. It's actually about making change at every level in the organisation. And that's why we've created jobs in middle management. We've created... Uh, we've doubled our apprentice scheme. Uh, we've put uh, a director of diversity and inclusion on the management board. Which is incredible. Well, that was very much, 
you know, I, ha I checked that out quite a lot because I thought, I, what I really, I don't want this to be seen as some kind of woke thing, you know? I really didn't. I just thought, but I couldn't find another way of having the conversations loudly mm. at the management board level without someone who had the lived experience of coming up a ladder in production, in TV, in, in you know, doing lots of different things. And so that was part of the spec for the job was you had to have done other jobs rather than being own, only a specialist in, in one thing. Um, and that is really has been very important because I think the conversation has changed. Now let's move on to a slightly different conversation. That's talking about BritBox because um, I, I was having a look at the stats, especially in Canada and America, and it really is, it's taken off really well, hasn't it? It's done brilliantly in uh, America and Canada. In fact, it's the international model, I think, is a very robust one. So it's, it's now got, I mean, the last figure is 1.2, but I know it's already exceeded that by, by quite some way, uh, million subscribers. And it, there's room to grow in America and Canada. And we're going to be rolling it out. So Australia is imminent, and then we'll start rolling it out from there. And the BBC and ITV are totally aligned uh, about that. So it's, it's, it's actually brilliant. Um, and BritBox UK, actually, particularly, is actually meeting all its targets, doing what it, it, it says, but it's a very different product mm -hmm. here because there are, you know, we all have our own services. So we have our own iPlayers and, and our hubs and whatever, whatever. So it's, it's more tricky with rights as well. Um, however, it is the only place you can get everything that's ever been done. Uh, that's British originated. You know, it is the the go-to place for multi-series box sets with British originated content. And I think Spitting Image is a big step in making it a very distinctive service because it is has really, I mean, it has it has had a widespread coverage and a lot of subscriber interest. Do you think that we we could end up with a situation where stuff is commissioned for BritBox specifically because it could do really well in those international territories? Well, actually, it's a really good question, that, because what is brilliant is if we think it's going to do very well on BritBox and international territories, we can co-produce it with the international division. And that obviously then brings the cost down for BritBox UK. The Spitting Image is a good example of that because it crosses boundaries very, very well. So it, that's a great example of that. And I think you'll see more of that to come. And do you think we underestimate as, as regular TV punters just how much of an appetite there is abroad for the incredible content that we make? Not really, because our studio's business, I mean, we sell a lot of uh, you know content we make to global services right around the world. And, and they love British content. British originated content. I mean, they really love it. So, so I don't think we underestimate it. We've, we've got a good business based on the back of that. <laughs> and do, will your focus now be, not focus, but is it important as a broadcaster to think about the, the brick box and the hub in terms of where TV viewership is going in the future? So I think it's definitely, we've said, you know, we have to be a digitally led media and entertainment business. And I think we have got this amazing channel, ITV1, which has huge audiences, and we will want to keep those audiences. We want to keep those big audiences. And we do that through major event TV. Uh, and I hope that has many, many years to come. I think it does have many years to come. But at the same time, you have people who also watch very differently. Some of the same people that are watching those major events are also watching other programs differently. And then people under 35, particularly, are watching things on demand all the time. And so I think what you'll see from us is a kind of evolution of our strategy to reflect those two things. One is we want to serve up mass audiences and quality, trusted, in a trusted environment, mass audiences to advertisers, but also it fulfills a very important part of our remit. But we will also want to do on demand in a bigger, better way. And ITV Hub, investing in it, personalization, recommendation, all of that, and BritBox are very much part of that future. But also talking about the future, uh, of course, we were supposed to have that PSB review, we were supposed to you know, start yeah. earlier on this year, yeah. but it's been delayed due to COVID and will restart again soon. As we know, it, you know, it's it's old. It was it was created at a time before we had those um, tech giants getting involved in the TV sphere. What would you like to see change in order to to preserve what we have with our PSBs? Mm. Well, the good news is the review is still happening, and that we've been told by Ofcom that before the end of the year, Ofcom will come out and 
uh, say what they think. And DCMS are also doing their own review of the PSB uh, ecology and they will be coming out separately before the end of the year or maybe early next year. I think one of the, the key things I would say is the urgency here. It, it's, it's kind of we've been talking about this for a long time. And you're absolutely right. In 2003, Actually, most of those companies didn't exist. No. So it wasn't even as if they existed in another, th in another shape. I mean, Netflix were, was, was, were delivering DVDs. And actually, I don't think Google existed. So uh, it, it, it was just, it was really, the PSBs were the monopoly. Mm. Whereas now the global uh, providers are the monopoly. So it was, it was that that act was created for a very different world. And I think if you're a PSB, what you're saying is you have to have prominence because if you don't have prominence, you will not, your content will not be found in this kind of new digital world with all of this content and with platforms who can exclude you. So you have to be included. And there's no provision for that. There's no legislation for that. So if you don't come to um, terms with a smart TV manufacturer, they can just leave you off. Yeah. So you're just not on there. So it's prominence, it's inclusion. And then we spend a lot of money making content as we've just been discussing. We take a lot of risk making content because it doesn't always work. We take the risk, but we need to see fair value for that. So, you know, when, in, the, in, the, in the linear world, that, that there is a framework for how that operates and you have to have prominence, you have to be on the EPG. But in a tile-based world, it, you know, you can sell that to the highest bidder, you can just, give prominence to the highest bidder and then you won't find PSB content. So that's kind of at the, you know, is, is at the crux of all of this. It's about prominence being included and fair value. Well, what would you say to those who would argue, but it's a fair market, you just have to do better and find a way of competing with those tech giants? Well, it's not a fair market. It's a very skewed market. It's not fair. It's not reasonable. It's anti-competitive, actually. Uh, you know, to exclude is anti-competitive. Um, so actually, that's what we're trying to address. I don't think, ITV will never, we're commercially funded broadcasters. We've never taken any money from anybody except our shareholders. And so we have to make returns for our shareholders. So what we need is a level playing field. We're not asking for special favors. We're saying the act that was created that regulates us highly in 2003 is not appropriate anymore because the whole world has changed and we're not monopolies anymore. We're not the dominant ones. There are other dominant players. And actually, if this, if this continues, I don't think PSBs will exist in the shape they are in today. They won't thrive. Yeah, they won't be able to thrive. It, they won't be able to flourish. And do you think the public understands the importance of, of PSBs, especially what we're currently going through and the importance of our new services that we have on the, on the channel, for example, both on a local and a national level? Do you think sometimes they don't necessarily understand what could possibly go? Well, I, I think you're right. I think the British public probably takes for granted a lot of what the BBC and ITV do, actually. But when you look at what we do, I think COVID probably brought home to quite a lot of people. I mean, you had the Queen talking about impartiality and accurate information of, of news and how glad she was for, 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 for the PSBs, effectively. Because you know you are going to get a trusted news source. You know it's not going to be misinformation or disinformation. And that is a massive value. Uh, in PSB. Um, and there are so many other things that go with being a PSB that the public won't know about, actually, which is we, um, we keep the independent, 80% of, uh, of, of independent production comes from a PSB. So we keep the creative economy kind of healthy um, out of London. And, we, you know, we spend a huge amount of money out of London. We are required to do that as part of our remit. You know, most other uh, operators don't do that. They are very London centric or M25 centric. There are so many other benefits of PSBs for Britain um, that I guess the public may not know about and maybe we need to make that well, louder. That's maybe what I was going to say. Do, you, do we need to we shout need to a little bit louder about what and it you is? Know, that a we lot do. of the content wouldn't be made. A lot of the stuff that goes on air would not be made if it wasn't for the fact that we were PSBs. Mm. And when people talk about the rivalry between BBC and ITV, historically that may well have been true, but, but it feels as though we're coming together uh, for a greater good. Would you say that's Well, I that's think that's correct? probably true, and I'd include Channel 4 and Channel 5 in that. I think Britbox is a great example of how 
all the PSBs came together uh, to actually put together a multi-series box set service, which is very, very good value at five ninety nine a month, you know, um, and has got this amazing depth and breadth of content which, from from all the PSBs. I think in many other ways, though, we're more collaborative. Uh, I mean, certainly since I've been in the in, in TV, uh, and I, 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 I've. I wanted it to be more collaborative because I think that's the way you went. Now we'll always compete. We'll compete for the nine o'clock slot on a Saturday <laughs> night. We'll always there'll always be competitive tension, and I think that's good. It's healthy. It keeps the creative output at a, a very very high. I mean, again, we take for granted how high the quality of British content is everywhere. Our independent producers are amazing. You know, BBC Studios, ITV Studios, amazing. You know, the, the output is, is fantastic. We take that for granted. But it's good to have that creative tension. I think on the big subjects, though, there's a lot of collaboration. Now, considering what we are currently in the middle of, we've mm. spoken about the pandemic and, and lockdown at the start. But I, sort of, I, I do want to finish on that, just because we don't know where we are at the moment. We don't know how long this is going to last. We don't know when we'll all be back in our offices again. We just don't know. So in terms of looking forward to where ITV sits in 2021 and, and beyond, are you very sure of, of the direction we're heading in? Or is there an element perhaps of, of nerves that we're still not at the end of this as yet? Look, I don't think we're at the end of it. You know, we, the advertising market, which we haven't really touched on, has been hugely impacted by that awful three months of lockdown where no one was really manufacturing things uh, except for entertainment companies. So they kept, kept us going, which is great. But, you know, if you weren't making cars, you weren't going to sell cars, so you weren't going to advertise them. And, and that's why it just kind of froze the market. And, and that was, has been really difficult. The good news is that's really come back. The advertising market has come back. Everyone's talking about Christmas campaigns, tone about that, how they present it. It's a different kind of Christmas. Everyone knows that, more uncertain. So it's been very healthy. And I, don't, but, and I want that to continue, obviously, but I don't know. So what we have to continue to do is continue to plan to be very careful about our cash because the only way to deal with this kind of uncertainty economically is to make sure you've got a strong balance sheet. So we have to do that. You know, I think that the one unassailable fact is that people are going to be watching a lot of content and that's great for us. And we have to keep producing that at the quality that we do and the engagement that we do. And we've got to, and we've got to keep doing that. So we need to keep our productions going safely. Um, and that's a priority for us. And then I think strategically, it doesn't actually change the direction of travel. You know, the fact that we are putting more resource behind what we would call on demand, which, which is whether that's ITV Hub, Hub Plus or, or BritBox, um, how we might commission for that will, will evolve. That's not going to change. You know, nurturing ITV One, that's not going to change. Uh, becoming much better at data and analytics. We've got better at it. We've got to get much better at it. That's not going to change. So I don't think the long term or the medium term changes. But I think in the short term, you've just got to watch your balance sheet. OK, well, Carolyn McCall, thank you so much for talking to us. Pleasure. Thanks also to YouTube, who are the sponsors of London Conference 2020. And do look out for more sessions with the industry's senior leadership, which will be scheduled uh, to come up in the next few weeks. Thank you.